Oh, nice one, Jen. That was Power Jen. 11 o'clocks on a, on a Wednesday. And if you didn't do it this week, Jen, you've made me look a dick. And if you're listening to this on uh, repeat or on the on the streaming bit of it, of the app, then you're not gonna make that's not gonna make any sense to you either, is it? But as always, you're all right. How are we? I'm the world around you, and this is pause for four on Fresh Old FM. Now. This week we're going to do another film, a little bit like we did when we took apart The Little Mermaid. Except this week we're going to look at what I thought initially was a live action remake of Shaolin Showdown. It's a film called The Last Airbender. It's by M. Night Shyamalan. I had to take a breath there. Too many A's. It's got to be worth saying that, you know, I've, I've, I've never seen the film before, innit? And I'm, I'm going into it. Like with The Little Mermaid, going into it completely blind. As I've said, I thought it was the Shaolin Showdown. I thought it was a live-action version of that. You know, with like fucking the water woman, the ground bloke, the bad guy called Jack that's got machines. Um, and it turns out it's very fucking... <laughs> it's pretty much the same. Um, and I don't think I've ever watched the last Airbender cartoon either, but just going off of the picture for it before the film starts... There's an androgynous character with a, a glowing arrow facing downwards on their head. So, could it be to tell the viewer about transhumanism and the next step of human evolution? I'm on the kids section of Netflix for this, in case anyone was wondering and wanted to watch it, watch it themselves. Because I think it's important, as a, as a responsible adult, to check what sort of tripe is being peddled to the kids. What did brainwashing taste like in 2010? What was the flavour? What was the flavour of brainwashing? Was it more of a... Was it a fruity flavour? Was it a sour flavour? You know, we won't know until we've watched the film. Can we watch the film, though, and find any hints to events that have happened in the past decade? Fuck knows. Probably not for the, the rest of you if you'd watched it, but I've been filling my head with nonsense for years, so it's got to be worth a go, hasn't it? Let's have a tune, and then we'll get started with M. Night Shyamalan's The Last Airbender. And that was Benny the Butcher with Black Fort. The song's called Crowns for Kings. It's alright, wasn't it? It starts with a message about the four nations of nomads. Earth, wind, fire and water. And it's already saying that there is one person that can speak to the spirits. Straight away, we're talking about the interdimensional beings fucking 30 seconds into it, me. 30 seconds in and we're already there. They're, they're saying that there's this icy place called the Waterlands and that there used to be a big city. Almost like it's talking about how an age ended when the Ice Age began. So is this the last age of man before the Ice Age? But it's also worth noting they refer to this as being in the north. And that's a lot like Greenland. And Greenland's supposed to be a place full of ice. But, fucking hell. At this, and then they start saying something, um, well, saying they can see this thing beneath the surface of the ice, the characters on the screen. And they can, because... And they start hacking at it, and there's this big fuck-off ball that just seems to appear, unless I didn't see it while they were typing. And could this be saying that the UFOs aren't actually UFOs, but they're actually USOs, and they come from underneath the ice? Which... We know the ice can is a potential entrance to Hollow Earth. From from last week, we learned a bit about that. Out of all of that uh, ball of ice, there's something fucking like um, I don't know how to describe it other than describing it as a big fuck off hairy monster and a hairless androgynous child. Could this be a little nod to Bigfoot and a grey, like as in a grey alien, possibly explaining that they came to Earth together? Then. The so-called Fire Nation appears, and they're said to have machines. Could this be an, an interpretation of the Romans, maybe? Because they've got helmets, and the Romans had similar helmets, and, you know, it could be. A young lad then demands that the elderly, a young lad from the, the Fire Nation, demands all of the elderly. But they take, they also uh, grip the bald kid and all, and his face has what looks like a computer circuit on it. Uh, the, the lad that demanded the old people says he wants to put the lad on his ship. Now, in this, the ship's obviously a boat, but maybe it's saying that an alien came to Earth and other aliens are actually looking to take him. They want to they take this, this alien that appeared on Earth. 
or maybe you know this alien that they're trying to find maybe it, it's tried to flee from whatever's going on in the in the galaxy or whatever and it's actually just hiding out on earth next notable thing that we see though is this massive floating dog which kind of adds to it being bigfoot bigfoot doesn't float that i've heard of but it would explain the lack of footprints in the jungles and the woods wouldn't it around america M maybe because in when you see pictures of him it looks like they're mimicking our walking but maybe they, they are literally just mimicking our walking to blend in and the feet aren't actually touching the ground all that often because they don't know the feet have to touch the ground because they're these ethereal beings that can just move through dimensions so how would it know that it needs to touch the floor how would it even know about gravity how the fuck do you explain gravity to something that wouldn't know what gravity is it'd be like trying to explain a color to a blind man and so you know bigfoot could float it then tells you that the spirit realm actually exists. They claim that the spirits of the spirit world have guided us as people and that only one person can speak to them. It literally says this, like looking down the camera lens as if it's talking to the children, but it's written in the, in the film. But realistically, what it's doing is it's telling this to your kids. Your kids are watching this film and you're thinking, oh, you know, it's all right to watch. It's only just a bit of fun. But the film's telling them that the spirit world exists, mate priming them for being when they're older being into films like annabelle and that you know they say that a boy can speak to the spirits and that he can change people's hearts but the technological army tests the boy and the kid he aces the test but then they try to imprison him then the big dog appears and roars but i mean could the dog be one of these spirits could fig bigfoot could he be searching for the equivalent of the airbender or simply waiting and that's why they're all in the forests. That's why we only ever see Bigfoot in the forest and not walking around like Stockport Town Centre or in a city London. You know, you never see Bigfoot there, innit? It's always in America in the woods. And America's kind of connected to Greenland, I think, still. And it's it's got like a northern land and a southern land and they're, they're very different climates. And there's a lot going on there, you know, and it kind of adds into it. Anyway, back into the film. We find out that this little lad's called Arn. I've spelt it with A-H-N, but like Arn, I, I don't know if I'm put, getting that across right with my accent, but Arn, like Arn, 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 this is like how they pronounce it, but that's like the start of the word Anunnaki, but there's other links and all, you know, it sort of links to Captain America because they say he's been in the ice for 100 years, uh, Steve Rogers wasn't in the ice for 100 years, but I've got another link and all. In Watchmen, the guy that they ended up fighting near the end, who was actually one of them originally, was hiding out with some weird creature in the ice too. So it's like the same, the same fucking trope is in three, three films there, and they've all got these whole worlds around them. Like the Marvel's literally got the MCU now, which is you know the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but it's also got the comics and this this Airbender manga and that, and then you've got. The Watchmen, which was a graphic novel, uh, there's probably more to The Watchmen as well. I've only seen the film, no. But it's weird that they're all similar. Arn enters another realm and starts glowing. Then he walks into a cave hearing owls. Like, not like, hoo -hoo -hoo, like howls as in with an H, you know, owls. Like a wolf would owl. Like a, but an owl tweets and caws, like, Ca -ca! but I think... Maybe that's more like a crow, but owls like with an H H O W L S. I don't know if I'm getting that across to you. It's hard for me to say. the The cave is full of icicles though, and they look like teeth. And then he meets this massive creepy wolf in there. This is another link to other films, like the caves that look like animals in Disney films. You know, like in there's a there's a monster cave in Aladdin. Um, there's there was one in the Little Mermaid. If you remember the Little Mermaid week, if you didn't go back and listen to that. Obviously, at the end of this, you know, don't don't be dropping out on me now. Not for that reason to go and listen to another. Fuck me. It's hard enough to get people to listen to this shite anyway. Fucking, but in The Little Mermaid, there was like a monster cave under the water. There's always a cave that kind of looks like a monster's mouth. The lad from the fire group is said to be disowned by his dad, who's the king. And by retrieving the airbender, he'll then become worthy as, a, as an heir to the throne. I don't know if that's irony there, that he wants to be heir to the throne and he's the airbender, more than like just coincidence at best, and even then reaching. Yeah, could this be to do with the king, though, of the hollow earth? You know, remember last week when I said there was a king to the hollow earth, a, a supreme ruler, if you like, of the in, inside of the earth? And they were said to be an advanced race, and the Fire Nation seemed to be very advanced compared to all these other tribes. 
Um, they're even said to be able to send huge machines made of metal, whereas none of the others seem to be able to do that. They're very much living in... Uh, I don't know what the right word is, like tents. They kind of look like tents, like shanty towns made of cloth. Arne says that he ran away, but he's, he's back now, which touches on another film that's kind of like the lion king in it when simba left simba left and it was fine but then he he came back to when he didn't you know he, he didn't want to be king because he thought it would be stressful like arn which i think is also the story of hamlet but i've never never watched it never read it it just seems i don't know it's not fantastical enough for me i guess too too realistic maybe uh, but simba left in it in the lion king the young lion and then when he came back there was tyrannical rulers there for him and all in, in the way of scar but in this it's the fire nation have come and they're fucking things up for everyone then there's a bloke from the fire nation discussing with what looks to be the leader of the fire nation about finding a great library that was said to not exist finding hidden knowledge about the ocean and moon spirits implying that they could use them to destroy the water tribe but that could be saying that something is controlling the ocean and the moon just teaching us that there is something controlling the ocean and the moon because we're told that the moon controls the ocean but what if that's just a subtle way of saying that they're somehow linked not linked by an invisible in, invisible uh, magic tether but linked because they're the same sort of ethereal creature they're referring to the earth bending lad as simply earth well the, the earth bending lad from the earth bending land like the the earth land but they're simply calling that earth um if you if you take it literally though as earth our planet then that does show that the fire nation are in fact aliens a kid tells a story about the prince of the fire king saying that he got burnt by his dad and could this be a reference to fallen angels like the devil Something that is associated with fire and also ties in with the hollow earth idea because the the devil thought to be in hell inside the earth. You know, or you can see how I got to that one, surely. For some reason, it's reminding me of the Imagination Land episodes of South Park, though, you know, where the kids get kind of abducted and then taken to a world where the Lollipop King has been taken hostage or something. It's like a fucking three-parter. And, um... Do, do you think that Imagination Land, like with a lot of South Park, what they do, but they kind of nod to things that have happened in the real world. So do you think by saying Imagination Land was the spirit world, but they couldn't call it the spirit world, full of like mental creatures and, and things that were said to be made up. And in, also in, within that, there was, there was the evil side of it all, of the spirit world or, or of Imagination Land with like Freddy Krueger in it and that and Jason Voorhees, when they wanted to invade the other side too. So... There's, there's little little links there. It's just mad to me. It's mental, me how it all just seems the same, innit? Then we see Arn fly off on his fucking dog. And could the dog be a way of showing that the spaceships the aliens use are actually alive? The Avatar is then sold out by a human, which, again, is reminiscent of Judas and Jesus. The Earthman sold the Avatar out because he needed money. Uh, I should say Avatar is the name of the airbender. His Arn is what he's referred to. He gets referred to sometimes as the Avatar. But he, the Earthman sold him out because he needed money. Because he felt that Arn had let him down. Which is like what happened with Jesus and Judas. And it, it turns out as well, in a weird link to Judas almost. And again, a previous episode. But um, there is a little um, a link, albeit fucking tenuous that the the wolf from before was actually a dragon and it's a dragon that not a wolf that gives tasks to the airbender that got made more apparent later in the scene and later in my notes um but weird to say wolf there well i'm talking about judas because some people believe that's actually where the story of the werewolf came from and how the werewolf gets killed by silver because apparently judas hung himself after taking the silver for selling out jesus but again some I found on the internet don't think it's actually in the Bible. There's someone lurking around who helps the Avatar escape, who kind of has teeth like Predator. Predator from, from the, the film, not like Predators from the Jimmy Savile episode. The way the airbender uses air looks almost like the Force, you know, from Star Wars. So when Star Wars came out, maybe... We only knew about the existence of the airbender because they'd come out of the ice very recently. Maybe it's only more recently that we've discovered that there are more, and then they've all been slowly alluded to in films. 
the prince got killed, I think. I think he's dead now. But we find out that he's known as the Blue Spirit, which kind of makes it seem weird, doesn't it? Like they've killed a kid and they've called him the Blue Spirit. We, we then see a massive ice wall and gateway where the waterbenders live. The Fire Nation say it's out of their reach, but there's an ice wall that Flat Earthers believe in, it, And they claim it's all heavily guarded and protected. And could this be why? Could this be why it's heavily protected? Because they know that on the other side of this ice wall isn't like a mystical... Well, it would be a mystical realm because we don't know what it is, but it would be this other world full of you know, like humans, but they're at war with people that we don't even know exist, mate. So they just close the wall off and we see it as an ice wall, but to like the people that are in the know, they just see it as like a fence. Anyway, we're then shown the princess of the water tribe and they look like the princess from Frozen and in Frozen, the woman... In it controls ice, which is just hard water, not like the one that ruins your kettle, but obviously like a brick in it made of water, like a wet brick. Could there be a reason behind this though? Could there be a reason why the woman from Frozen looks like the princess from the water tribe? Is it is it to have the image of this lady in our heads just in case we have to learn of her existence in case something fucks up or they lose the fight or they win the fight and we got to know who she is because she saved us all? Or... Is it simply because her costume design and blue sort of looks like ice? Anyway, let's have a song. This is Hard by Joel Ortiz, King Crooked and MRKSX. The Fire Nation comes back on screen and they've found the ocean and moon spirit and now they want to kill him. Why would destroying these creatures be worth doing? Unless maybe they can replace these creatures, they know what these creatures do. So then they can work out how to replace them. Like well, if you didn't listen to the truth seeking episode with me and Jimmy Bud the other day. Uh, on uh, the episode 3 it would be. We, we would briefly discuss how maybe there was a, a, weapons, a weapon that had been created. That can mimic what certain uh, mountain spirits can do to the weather. So maybe that's a nod here to that. Saying that's what could could be going on that's why they want to kill these spirits so that they can replace them with machines that can be controlled easier than the spirits can be because they don't have to be reasoned with because it's just a machine until of course like the machines rebel and then in a hundred years time some weirdos also sat underneath a, a staircase talking about how people might be able to talk to machines because we're all by that point fully aware of this spirit, spirit realm but that's getting to you know, that's that's not based in reality at all. I can't say what's going to happen in 100 years' time. You can just say what's happened in this film, innit? Anyway, the princess, right? She explains that she was born sleeping. So maybe the princess was born stillborn. So it seems a bit weird that they would put that in the story, saying that there's a stillborn child who is, like, fucking princess of the ice world. Because you would imagine that most kids born in a freezing cold place would run a risk of being born stillborn but I, like I'm not a doctor in it I don't know it's just as a guess because you wouldn't imagine that the optimum temperature for childbirth would be like minus five anyway her parents to to bring her back partook in a weird ritual about it being dipped uh, her being dipped in sacred water and it's weird because it's a, it's like a little tribute to the moon spirit but that's the only uh, Maybe that... I don't know how to explain it. Maybe that's only a, a deity that's representing something high up in the air. So they're calling it the moon spirit because we can all see the moon. Whether the moon's real or not, or a DNA splicing facility or a weapon. Fuck knows, it's not about that this week. But we can all see the moon. We all know the moon's there. So maybe that's just a way of saying the moon spirit. Maybe there's a, there is a deity in the sky. Like when you're a kid, you think God's in the sky. And he's, you know, he's not, then as you get older, you're told, oh, he's all around you, he's everywhere, he's in everything. And then as you get a little bit older, you realise it's, it's, it's mostly nonsense. But, and bringing up Christianity again, that, that kind of, like I say, we have God in the air, don't we? And they've got the moon deity in the air. So it's it's kind of like Christianity there in, in two ways. Because you've got the, um, there's, that's like a baptism and all, isn't it? To, to say that she had this weird ritual about being dipped in sacred water. That's literally what Christians do to their kids. They get like a six-month-old baby or whatever and dip its head in a sink by a paedophile in a frock, usually. Uh, dips, a, dips a kid's head in some water 
kid cries because it's a fucking weird thing for it to experience and then everyone goes home for sandwiches and we only do that to get rid of original sin because of Eve because of an apple that was given to her by apparently the devil which I don't know I've really lost myself here getting getting back into the film black ash begins to then fall from the sky because the fire nation has reached the ice wall and we see the prince getting off on a boat the the prince of the fire nation it's getting hard now isn't it because you've not seen these people but the prince of the fire nation gets off the boat and his handler this weird old guy that's hanging around with him all the time holds his hand up uh to wave like as if to wave goodbye to him but he keeps his hand still and just whispers be safe like that like proper fucking weird isn't it now could this mean that when we wave and say goodbye by raising our hand maybe it somehow aims our intentions so by getting us to say goodbye to people it don't really mean anything does it it just means we're happy to say we're happy they're going which is weird because most of the time when someone fucks off you're not really happy that they're going unless it's like a fucking door-to-door salesman or like a Jehovah's Witness at your door or something or the takeaway guy you know you're happy when the takeaway guy leaves because it means you get to sit down with your kebab sooner but maybe if we was to hold our hands still and not wave it around because maybe the waving it around deflects what's, what it's to do but if you hold your hand still and, and aim your palm of your hand at the person you're talking to and just say things like be safe maybe that will make them be safe then I don't know Arn makes a sign with his hands at one point that looks like if he turned it up to his head it'd look like owl eyes which is weird because owls are associated with magic and this seems like magic what they're all doing could these powerful hand movements be the reason behind handcuffs were handcuffs originally invented to bind together the hands of magicians so that they can't retaliate could the dragons be the, the forest spirits because they keep talking about forest spirits in this film i keep forgetting that you've probably not seen the film and you haven't you're not watching it with me uh, maybe anyway these forest spirits have all been killed like like the ocean and the moon spirits are going to be killed or so we're told and and that could be where we get saint george from we because obviously you know like saint george is said to have killed all the 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 the, uh, the, the dragons but then you've got um the oh, fucking hell the irish guy there was an irish who support uh, the irish saint the irish patron saint is it saint patrick or is that just being stupid he's supposed to have driven the snakes out isn't he and that's that seems a lot like driving out the lizards as well the, the uh well it's a reptile isn't it just like a dragon's a reptile could that be where we get all them from the the forest spirits were dragons because i can think of fucking loads of films where there's the fucking dragons in the forest loads and we then see that the fire team are paired up with literal lizards except the lizards aren't attached to the spines of the members of the blazing squad but the firemen are actually sat on the spines of the lizards because they're riding them maybe the humans are being used to charge up the ethereal lizards in the real world like in our world not in the airbender world uh, to use them in a fight in an upcoming war or maybe a war that we can't even see that's being fought now. Maybe that's what vampires are, I mean, Not the actual vampires themselves, but the idea of them. It might be a way of switched on people, getting the word out there to people in a way that was easy to understand. Maybe it was too easy to understand and protected people too well against vampiric onslaught. And now we can only decipher fragments of different films and TV shows and pierce them together to find out what is real and what isn't real. This is Pause for Thought on Threshold FM. That was Sunspot Johns and Living Legends with Purple Kush. The Fire Nation can continue their attack because they have a plan for the moon. What's the plan for the moon then? Has, has anything ever been done to the moon? A lot of people believe that we went to the moon and a lot of people do not believe that we went to the moon. You know... The ocean and moon spirits are referred to as yin and yang, and one is grabbed out of the water, meaning that there's an imbalance at this point. The character even warns about it, but the fella stabs the fish in the sack, like in literally in like a bag. He puts the fish in like a hessian bag, and then stabs it with a knife or a dagger. If that's 
any bit of fact, if that's based in fact at all, right, that fish being stabbed in a bag, could the commonly used phrase, like shooting fish in a barrel, possibly come from a Roman stabbing a fish inside of a pillowcase? Could that be why Catholics use a fish as a symbol? Maybe it's a scoreboard. You know, like you have it on the backs of the cars and that, don't they? Maybe the other fish went into hiding amongst the oceans itself. And that's why fish get eaten all around the world. They're trying to capture the fish, guys. They're trying to capture the other fish. The ying to the yang fish that was killed. Or the yang fish to the ying fish that was killed. They're trying to get it. They want to stick it in a pillowcase and stab it. The princess can even give her life for this magic guppy to restore it. Maybe this is where the film becomes make-believe, though, showing a, a happy ending as the young lady floats towards a certain death, as her soul gets ripped out from inside of her body uh, by the, all the holy water that she's around. Now, is that what baptism is? Could a baptism be a way of, instead of washing away the so-called original sin, are they actually trying to see if they can find the soul of this fish within the, the babies that they baptise? Is that what's going on? One day, some some little baby will be being baptised. It could even be like an adult baptism, innit? We're not going to just limit to the children. Don't just blame the children. You know, older people get baptised and all. And will they just be dipping their head in the holy water, in the holy basin? There must be another name for it, which I can't remember. Uh, but in this, this holy sink, the, the faucet of the Lord... Are they gonna be? Are they gonna be washing a, a baby's head, and a prized cod's just gonna seep out of a child into the the holy bath, uh, and that'll be it, mate. Fucking game over. They'll have access to both fish. Then the Christians, the Catholics, have got both fucking fish. They've got ying fish and yang fish, and they're just gonna fucking put it in a bag and fucking stab it. It's mad. Or could it be that they're trying to release the fish? Could they be trying to find the ying fish to the yang fish? So that they can release it back into the water to restore balance to the earth uh, or, you know, to, to all of the realms that surround us. Could media be a way to turn people against Christianity and religion in general by showing holy forces waging war? Even in like history books when you're a kid, on the telly all the time, on the news, there's always some form of religious holy war going on or some some religious subtext to a fight, you know. Uh, this would mean that the people reading into this, like when the people watching The Last Airbender, this would mean that they wouldn't baptise their children at the risk of them dropping a sturgeon in the pool. And this keeps the world chaotic in order to help keep the upper hand for their, for their takeover, for whoever, you know, they are. Let's have another song. They are. It was obviously Obi Trice with the aptly named Obi story. It shows us an angry kid, the fire prince, and he is told to walk away. And that, the others there, they're, they are trying to, um, well, I won't pussyfoot around, they're trying to capture him. I haven't really got a, got a little joker out there, I thought I might have something in the back of my head, but fuck all. Maybe there are still people, though, who are kind, and who want simply what's best for their people. In all of these groups, maybe they see all of these groups as quote-unquote their people. And they just want what's best for them, you know. But maybe these good people, let's call them, are outweighed by all of the selfish people who are only ever really considering themselves. The lad doesn't show this because he just wants to be king. But the old man, his handler, his, his uncle that follows him around... But, I mean, that just makes me think, if he is just an uncle following him around, then maybe he's just protected his investment, you know, maybe in a molesting sense, maybe. But I don't think the film really even alludes to that. But maybe the, the handler of these powerful people, or the, the magicians, let's call them what they are, the magicians, or the spirits, you know, the people that handle the spirits, maybe they're in, in you know, in fact, they're... What would, what would you call it? You'd, you'd say that they're in ownership. They they own. They they take ownership of these people. The handler maybe takes ownership of these people in the same way that a, a father does of his child or an uncle does of his nephew. Let's use the fucking example in front of us, eh? And they're then in a very powerful position by owning these these mental children, so they can control them, and that makes him seem not that benevolent, innit? 
Now, could the weird Tai Chi style positions that the elemental kids get into it, to, you know, to control the elements around them, could that be a way of ensuring that they're hitting something in as many different dimensions as possible, showing us yet again that there are other multiple dimensions surrounding all of us? Arn makes a massive wave. Not like he's saying goodbye, but like at the end of The Little Mermaid where the sea goes fucking mental. But could an entity with these powers be powerful enough to have flooded the entire world at some point, or transpirated entire oceans and seas from one place to another to destroy entire peoples? They all bow to Arn, kinda like how we're told that everyone will be lined up in front of Jesus for his return, but the last lines in the scene is about how they want you to become the Avatar. Like literally you, not there's not a character. It's not mean, don't mean the world around you. I'm not. It's not a joke. I mean literally you. They fucking. Um, could it be that to to do with you know how real life seems to be becoming more virtual and it, we're entering more of a virtual world day after day because the the ball kid's hand he's stretched out to the screen as if to pull you into the screen like in fucking Nightmare on Elm Street 3 except he's not going to bash your head off the static of the TV screen and leave you hanging out of it fucking just from your neck I think he just wants you to come and enter the virtual world with him maybe the virtual world will be the way that they teach us about the spirit world and they'll, they'll, they'll use that to introduce us to these things that live in the spirit world who can interact with our digital world but not with the physical world maybe is that, is that the message from the film? All of this, this hour and a half of... I'm not going to say not much went on, but stuff did happen. But all of that, just to, to ready the children of 2010, 10 years ago, for virtual reality headsets and experiences. Maybe there's more to come now. Maybe we'll live our entire lives in other worlds through a computer simulation as an avatar, the main character in the film. Like in the 2009 film from the year before, Avatar. Maybe Avatar is about the spirit world and all, and that it shows a, an artificial way of controlling the magic people through machines, like what this film touched on repeatedly when they'd said that they'd got the way of, we, we know what the, the ocean spirits do, we know what the moon spirit does, we, we can control that, we can do that. That's fucking... That's Avatar. But... Like, they, they say it happens in this movie universe when the Fire Nation begins to bring their machines in. And the leader of the Fire Nation talks about the importance of a comet. And there's been cults in, like, the 1900s, mate, in the past fucking... Even probably in the past 60 years. Less. In the 90s, man. There was one in the 90s. They, they try to use comets and all. And androgyny. Androgyny gets thrown around in some cults, don't they? Because they fucking start lopping the balls and the dicks off of people and chopping the tits off and that. You know, stopping them from fucking as well. And that might be why all of these films have children in. Because you don't oh, you don't associate children with having sex and that, do you? you? You associate it as a purity, a child. So you would associate maybe an androgynous person with the dick and balls cut off as, as pure. Maybe unfortunate, but put pure, you know. Uh, but they want to use the energy from the comet in the film, from the, the proximity, to, to boost their literal firearms, uh, giving them that extra bit of firepower to use in battle. Now, you've not seen the film, and it, so I should explain. Um, they're not, they've not got guns. When they say they've got machines, it's like boats and that, these mad boats, and they do have some mad machines, but not a load of them, but just more than everyone else. But by firearms, I mean they can fucking turn their arms to fire and throw out fire from their hands like a fucking flamethrower me the literal flamethrowers but the comets in uh, when i was saying about the cults the comets in their eyes they've been looked to for things like reaching other worlds and you know like the, the, i think it was the Haley bob comet the Haley comet bob comet bob Haley bob fuck knows i can't i can't fucking place it but the idea i think it was my, my matthew applewaite applewaite or summit uh, fucking heaven's gate anyway they wanted to board a comet to move to another world, mate. But that's that's not in the film. Obviously, that's that's in the real world. And but that's where the film ends. So it touches on quite a fair bit there. I'm not going to review it as a film. You know, I'm not here to review the films. I, I couldn't give a shit what I, 
it doesn't matter what I thought of something, I'm just trying to teach you the things hidden inside these films. If you want to learn some stuff, it's definitely worth a watch. But if you've seen a lot of other films over the past few years, then it's probably going to be pretty predictable. Because it is from 10 years ago and it does seem to rely heavily on bits from Avatar the year before. And it's not even related to Avatar. Anyway, let's have another song. I'm going to go for something a little bit different here. This is Leonard Skinner with The Ballad of Curtis Lowe. That's the end of the show. This has been Pause for Thought. I'm the world around you and you're listening to Fresh Old FM. And to, to finish out the show, we'll have a bit of Khan. This is Lotto. I'll see you in a bit. <laughs>